Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see everyone. Uh, welcome. We have the privilege of studying the Haftorah for Parshat Shemot this week, which can be found in your stone Chumash on page 1146. 1146, I believe. Uh, thank you, Sydney. Um, and you'll notice that uh, right off the bat, there are actually two Haftorot, two different traditions as to which Haftorah to read for this week. One of the rare times that not just we have different traditions, but they're totally different. One is from the beginning of Yirmiyahu from Jeremiah, which is a smart tradition, and ours is a smattering of, uh, of places from Isaiah, from Yishayahu, beginning in chapter 27, chapter 27, uh, 6 through the end, and the first 13 chapters of, the first 13 uh, verses of chapter 28, and then we bring, skip a little, and come back to in the middle of chapter 29. Um, so it's sort of a scattered uh, half Torah. Um, We've discussed this in the past, so we're not going to spend so much time tonight, today, about why these, why each haftar is. But uh, as we've, I've, as we noted, and we continue to note, the haftar is as much a commentary on the parsha as it is on as anything else. And part of that dictates why different traditions, the Swartim and Ashkenazim, diverge when it comes to this parsha. On the one hand, the Swartim haftar is all one unit, all one prophecy, all consecutive. Um, and quite clear what the prophecy is intending. It's the story of Jeremiah, of his commissioning to be a prophet, who is cast in the role in the same way as Moshe Rabbeinu, as Moses is. Um, and that matches very nice with the storyline at the beginning of Shemot, which is the rise of the next Jewish leader. And that, that storyline carries us through, through the end of the entire Torah, right? Moshe becomes, we chronicle Moshe's leadership journey. Right, and we chronicle Moshe as a leader all the way until his death. Right, the whole Torah, the last words are all about Moshe, 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 and that's an important facet. Moshe plays uh, unique, important. I, those words don't even undergird how much, how significant Moshe's role is. Um, and so, the Sephardic tradition takes up this idea of thematically connecting to the. Uh, introduction of a new leader, a new prophet, and the unique, sui generis uh, prophecy of Moses. The Ashkenazi tradition, on the other hand, chooses a different line, and it emphasizes the people of Israel, the story of the Jewish people in exile, the story of the challenges that that means, and the lessons that that brings for us forward, the story of Egypt and of the Jewish people there. And that Haftorah is echoed in our Haftorah, I'm sorry, that theme is echoed in our Haftorah um, and those choices. We're not talking about a single leader. There's no references, as we've seen in re recent weeks, to David or Slomo or the Abdit Semach. Um, this is really about the holistic, the Jewish people as a whole. Um, and that's the storyline, the theme that uh, the Haftorah for the Ashkenazim that we read, that we're going to study today, amplifies and magnifies and uh, is echoing in choosing that. And that's sort of the difference between the two. We're obviously going to look at Yishayahu um, for two reasons. One is because we're Ashkenazim, but also we'll get to be able to study the Haftorah for uh, the other Haftorah for Shemot, which is the first chapters of Yirmiyahu, because that is actually part of the Shivs and the Chemtas, the uh, Haftorah uh, in preparation for uh, Tisha B'Av. So that is, that's, that's our introduction. Um, we're going to study Yishayahu, um, Isaiah. Now, this part of Isaiah is sort of split into two, two pieces. The, the messages we have, they're a little harder to understand. Isaiah is part of the later prophets, is one of the, the foundational later prophets. Um, and therefore, the prophecies are less stories and more um, uh, cryptic, obscure, prophetic visions that we're not exactly sure what the messages are. Um, and really, it vacillates, it ping-pongs, between two things. It's resonant for messianic images of the future of what this is. And there are debates among the commentary when exactly these are given. It's generally in the time period at the end of the second temple, but is this after the Jews in the Northern Kingdom are exiled? Is it anticipating a time when the temples are already destroyed? Is it before, is it concurrent? And, and that's one of the challenges. Um, Number two, the other part of this ping pong is uh, the message, the political message of the time, right? Yeshayahu is weighing in on the political question of the time. What's the central political of the time, political question of the time? Well, you have to know one thing about ancient Near Eastern culture. Ancient Near Eastern culture, 
operated, or at least political culture, statecraft operated on one thing. Who has more power? Who has less power? What are you going to do for me? What am I going to get from you? And we see this over and over again, both in Chumash, in, in Navi, excuse me, in the prophets, in Tanakh, but also in contemporary, in other contemporaneous uh, writings where, you know, this power was too strong. So the neighbors went and hired that power to help them. They paid them money. They came to help them as tribute. You'll be my friend because I'm stronger than you. And if not, I'll conquer you. Or we'll be your friend because our neighbor's really strong and together we'll counterbalance them. It's a lot of this power politics dynamic. Um, and that's really what the Jewish people are stuck between, right? There are two strong powers in the Jewish, in this world at that time. There is the Northern to the North of them and to the sort of the uh, Euphrates and the uh, Arabian Peninsula and Mesopotamia, that area. There's Assyria, the growing Assyrian uh, uh, army and what they represent. Um, and then their, their, their uh, successor, Bavel. And then you also have uh, in the south, the enemy, the army, the strength, the power of the empire of Egypt and the Egyptian power. And that's sort of the balance. Um, and so the Jews are scared of Ashur and they're scared of Babylon. So they try to align themselves with the south, with Egypt to support them. And um, Yeshayahu is also critical of that as well, of their balance there. That's sort of the introduction. Let's read through a little bit about Torah. And they're really, I would say three uh, concrete units, uh, uh, three concrete um, yeah, units that this Haftorah comes into. There's the first part of the till the beginning of the next chapter. So I guess the, the rest of this chapter. Then there's the 13 verses of the next chapter. And then the third part where we skip. Those are the three units. We'll, we'll look at them individual. Abayim Yashrei Shakov, the in the in the coming days, Jacob will take root, yet Sisu Farach Yisrael. Israel shall blossom and bloom, and the, the face of the world shall be covered with fruit, with produce, or uh, as contemporary Israelis might think, with cottage cheese. Um, uh, there is a little bit of a pun here that is being deployed, but Tenuva is the uh, dairy company in Israel that makes cottage cheese. Thank you, Cindy, for laughing at my joke. I think makes I mean, yogurt, makes everything dairy. Yeah, yeah, I think I made it. I think I made this joke last year also when I... Uh, when I taught this half Torah. So it's good in a year, year to year, I can make the same jokes as long as they're funny. Um, um, there is a little bit of a pun that's in, in, intended in this verse. Um, um, there's also tevuna, right? There's sort of like a, a lighted way of reading this that it is tevuna is, uh, tevuna is like knowledge, wisdom, right? So it's not just, obviously in the metaphor, it's about fruit and produce, uh, Jacob will sprout, will take root, will, will flower, um, and will grow fruit. But also, this isn't, uh, and they'll fill the entire world, not with fruit, but what is the real fruit that Jacob brings to the world? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. And so you sort of have that um, resonance in your head. Um, why doesn't say malupne tevel peirot? Why doesn't it say it'll fill the world with fruit? Or with uh, with with uh, yitar and tirosh and other words for that? Because I think the prophet is playing on this tibuna, tibuna, tibuna. I'm sorry, tenuva, tenu, tevua. Sorry to play over here. All right. And the rest of this set's a little bit more complicated. Hakimakat makayu ikau im keherik haruga horag was the beaten beat as bad as the beater? Did the sufferer, did he suffer as much as the slayers who slayed him? With a sasa'a, we'll come back to that word in a second. Agav, Rufak, Hashab, Yom Kadin. In a sasa'a, they were blasted with fury. And uh, with a, with a, with, on a day of a galing wind that, that bore off uh, what, they, what they received. We'll come back to all this in one moment. One more verse. Here is how you should punch, uh, how you should uh, purge and expunge the sins of Jacob. And, 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 and everything. 
Um, and this is how you remove all the uh, pre, the fruits, again, that metaphor from before, of, the, of their sins, right? Meaning remove the, the guilt of their sins. Bisumo, kol avne mizbeach. Um, um, you should remove all the, you should make all the altars like scattered blocks. I mean, get rid of the, the altars the, the, to the idolatry. Get rid of the asherim, the, uh, the trees that are uh, set aside to of idolatry and all the incense altars. What's going on here? What's going on here? So there are different ways that the commentaries understand this. Either they understand this as about the not about the, the in ancient the ancient the, the the ancient powers of the world, right? They're going to get they're just they're going to suffer, and and how do you know that Jacob will take root and will be saved? Did Jacob really suffer as much as his beaters will? Meaning, Jacob gets exiled by Assyria, by Bavel, but Bavel and Assyria will be wiped off the world, and Jacob will not. And therefore, we'll see that Jacob will still take root because Jacob survives. Um, is Jacob suffer as much as those that are slaughtered because their slayers slaughtered them? Um, again, sort of this, this thing, Vesasa'a. There's a whole question, what does this word Sasa'a mean? It could mean like uh, in like uh, uh, it could mean in like a like a a, a stirring, un, a totally unknown, sort of maybe from the word like uh, sora, like a like a like a storm. Um, but others explain that it's actually a measure, right? A sa is a, a measure of. Uh, of of something a dry measure in in Jewish thought, um, and so you end and, and in in midrash right and I'm sorry in navi so sasa could mean measure for measure or in a small measure you'll get assailed but everyone else will get a larger measure. How do we know? So there's a question exactly what what exactly this is going to verse number nine. What is the key to our redemption? How do we know? All we need to do to purge our sins, right? And this might be part of the, the same expression. We'll survive, we'll take root, we'll flourish, and we'll grow. Because all we need to do to purge our sins is X, Y, and Z. But everyone else, they're going to be destroyed because their sins are too great to purge. What, are, what do we have to do to purge our sins? Therefore, how do we do this? Removing idolatry. Removing idolatry, removing the asherah, removing the chamanim, the uh, incense places. So obviously it's about, it could be about the way we, the idolatry, but also the mizbeach here is remnant of another sin that is often um, uh, uh, commonly attested in the prophets over and over again. They castigate the people, not just for serving idols, but for not serving God properly, right? This, uh, this mizbeach is the bamu. Even worship to God when done inappropriately is problematic. And that's also what the prophet here is taking them to task. How do you worship God? How do you how will you resolve your sins? It's not by just worshiping even the true God properly, but it's by uh, doing it. I'm sorry, it's not just by worshiping the true God inappropriately, it's by doing that properly. Um, the fortified cities will be desolate. The homestead will be uh, uh, deserted, like a like a forest, like that forest, like a uh, uh, midbar or wilderness. Shamira ego. There they'll you know in these widely fortified cities, filled occupants of whatever of you know that's where cattle will 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 graze and will sit down and uh, and lie. Um, for the crown has uh, withered. Um, they come and they don't understand, and they don't understand what their issue is. They not they're not they're not they're not in the hemtvuna. There's again this wisdom play comes out. Um, and therefore, they're not doing the right thing, and they're, they're not understanding what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they're 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 engaging with God inappropriately. Therefore, they will not have mercy. 
Um, and on that day, Yachbot Hashem, Yishibot, Hanar, Anach, Mitzrayim, God will beat out the people like rains from the channel of the Euphrates all the way to the Wadi of Egypt. And God will pluck out the Jewish people one by one to redeem them. And on that day, God will sound the great horn. And those that have strayed, that are dead, that are exiled to Ashur will come back. And those that are uh, stranded in Egypt, uh, exiled to Egypt, they'll come back. They will bow down to God in Jerusalem on the holy mountain. Right, that is the end of the first section over here. Um, and there, as we noted, there's some question about what this is referring to. Is this referring to in their time? In their time that uh, this is what will happen? Is this sort of a comment? doesn't matter if you're going to be exiled to the north or to the south, to either of these powers, all of them are bad. You have to trust God. You have to focus on worshiping God properly. Um, and that was what will solve you. Is this a, a, a post-apocalyptic vision of what it will look like the end of days, the messianic era, that God will redeem us and e uh, Egypt and Ashur represents stands in for sort of the global powers of the world, wherever you are, you'll be brought back. And how will we be brought back? Even though we've suffered, will be it's because of our connection to Torah, because of our connection to serving God properly, being an on note, being a nation of wisdom, of knowledge, that will be the gateway. Um, the uh, Dat Mikra, which is a compendium of uh, commentary written in Israel um, recently, not recently, you know, the last generation. Um, it, which it really focuses word for word um, and tries to understand the like a more of a holistic way of looking at the text. So they describe that maybe the Haftorah for this was chosen for a third reason, not what we mentioned before, and gives another vista onto the section. And maybe this is a midrash, this is a metaphor, an analogy about what happens in Egypt, in the Exodus, right? What happened? The people came. They were, uh, they suffered, right? They clearly suffered. They were straw, right? There was that biyom beruach kadim, right? That that strong uh, wind, that day of strong wind, finally they get saved, right? Um, what do they have to do? They have to serve God, right? They have to remove their idolatry. They have to recognize the role they have to do. Um, and that this idea, Yachbot Hashem, Yishibot Hanar, Anacham Mitzrayim, that God will, pluck out the Jewish people from the Nahar, which might not be the Euphrates, maybe then it's the, the Nile, all the way to Nahal Mitzrayim, all the way to the boundary of the Wadi of Egypt, which is the south of Israel. Um, all of them, God will there collect the Jewish people, redeem them from Egypt, right? This is passive, this is re past tense. It's referring to what happened. Um, and, and what happened on that day, right? There was uh, not, the Egyptians were punished. Not all the Jews did make it out, right? There are, you know, the, this can give license to some of those other understandings that we have. Um, and maybe that's why this Haftorah is chosen, because the connection is to the story, the narrative of the people. And this is a prophet reflecting on that narrative. Um, and I think this is very compelling. Um, whether Isaiah is commenting that this is really what Egypt is about or not, that I think is irrelevant, right? The Haftorah, the people who are choosing the Haftorah and connecting it to our Parsha uh, are clearly choosing this for a reason and freeze framing it in a way, you know, and framing it in a way that, it, that brings this up. And we'll see, there's some other comparisons to Egypt that come up. We'll reference Barad, we'll reference Dever, we'll reference the hail and the pestilence. So there, there seems to be some connections here. I mean, and there's another piece which tie into the theme of Egypt. So let's go on. Chapter 21, chapter 28, verse one, right? This represents a new section. And there are, I think there are seven or eight, I forgot to count before, of, of prophecies that begin with this ho, a last, uh, you know, uh, like a lament, right? There's a whole section here. And they remember there, they talk to different people depending on the prophecy, but they're sort of collected here in the next couple of chapters. 
Um, a te, oh, alas, let us lament, a dirge. A terra deu chikare Ephraim, right? Uh, Isaiah pulls no punches. We've seen that with uh, Amos. Isaiah is no different. A terra deu, what's an atara? A crown, a crown. A terra deu chikare Ephraim. Oh, proud crowns. Oh, fat, drunken Ephraim. Who's Ephraim? What does Ephraim refer to? We saw this in the past. Um, the uh, the lower kingdom, I think. Right, now it refers to a kingdom. It's the upper kingdom. Ephraim, you'll say, is synonymous with the upper kingdom, with the northern kingdom. With the the kingdom. doomed ones. What? The doomed ones. The doomed ones, right. Oh, proud crowns of the drunkards of Ephraim. The Tzitz Novel. A Tzitz is a, like a royal crown. It's also what the coin, the coin wears. Um, but this is uh, Novel. This is uh, wilted, right? Uh, uh, a spoiled um, sort of uh, past its glory. Sivi Sefarto, I'll share, I'll share, I'll rosh that should adorn the head, that should be glorious on the head, on the tiferet, on the the blue, the beauty, the glory. I share a rosh geishmanim, who sits on the on the on the head of 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 shmanim, of fattened, bloated, overly indulgent people. Halume yayin that are overcome and drunken, seeped in by wine. Um, he's strong language here, right? Um, he is critical of the opulent consumptions, the hedonism that has taken over the northern kingdom. Hine chazak Um, lo, um, you, my God, God is strong and mighty, right? If you recall. I, I don't. I haven't seen a commentary mention this, but when I read this haftorah, when I read this uh, haftorah, it struck me. Kazak um, We tell the Jewish people: be strong, be mighty, be courageous in your beliefs. They're not. They're lethargic, fat, bloated drunkards, drinking off the fat of the land. Right. So the the we sort of uh, I, again. I think this is sort of a pun. You expect chazak v'amitz. You're supposed to be strong. Uh, you're, you're chazak v'amitz. You're supposed to be strong and courageous for God. And who's then really going to be strong? Ine chazak v'amitz Hashem. God is strong and courageous. In Zerah Barad, like a presence of a hailstorm. Sarah Kratev, kizera mayim kaverim shofim iniach la'aretz biyad. That God rains down like a like a like a shower of pestilence of disease. Of uh, torrential rain that it's not just comes down at the earth. Imiach la'aretz biyad is thrown down forcefully to the ground with, with 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 hands. Right? It's a much. It's a very dramatic, strong, mighty image. Viraglayim teramasna Ephraim trampled un, under the underfoot should be. They get trampled. Right? You have. That throws down with by hand with that with the with with your, with God's hand, and then we we continue the metaphor, right? And they get trampled under the foot, under Baraglayim, under the feet. Um, these fat drunkards of of Ephraim, right? And this wilted crown on the bloated heads. On the on the on the heads of the bloated men with their fancy food and their rich things that should be um, sweet sibarto should be the, the the apex of their glory of God's glory of their glory. Um, that uh, that uh, that um, that that that. Uh, that, that like the like the, like an early grape that's before you even get it it's totally dis absorbed it's totally devoured it's not there by by yom hahu on that day yeah Hashem svakot God should be God will be uh, on that day the Lord of Hosts will be la teretz tzvi will be the we keep talking about this the tzvi the tzvi tifaro the uh, adorned of beauty 
God will wear the crown of glory, right? They've taken it from God, right? God took their chazak ve'amats, and God, and and they they have taken the crown of glory. God will take that back. And will be a diadem of glory for the remnant of their people. And for the spirit of judgment, for the divine God, uh, or or whether this is for the individual, for a person, or for... Um, Right, I think in your in your translation before you is that for the spirit for a judgment for a spirit of judgment for him for who sits on the injustice is that him capitalized or not? No. Right. So that seems to be like the person, right? But Rashi points out that this is Yeah, God will be the one giving justice. God will be the one that justice, God who sits in judgment, for the valors of those who repel the gates, right? God, this is all about God retaking them, right? And this is actually the next point that's really important to think about, about the Egyptian narrative. Why do the Egyptians get punished? Not just because they refuse to accept God, not just before because they have um, uh, enslaved the Jewish people, but as God says over and over again, and axiomatically, philosophically, when God punishes people who deserve to be punished, when righteous justice comes into the world, God is glorified, right? There's a glorification of God when righteous judgment occurs. And that's part of what happens here also. In our Parsha, it's about punishing the Egyptians, that God will be glorified by being engaged in meeting out the Egyptians what they deserve. But also in our Parsha, in our, sorry, in our Torah, it's not the Egyptians that are subject of this punishment, but it's the uh, saddened, bloated um, leadership, aristocracy, the rich people of the, of the Northern Kingdom. And when they're punished, when the ring hails down on them, and when they're trampled by the feet for their sin, right, that also glorifies God. And it amplifies that philosophical thematic root that ties both into a, the Parsha and the Aftura. Continues, yeah, please, Steve. Uh, this may be a, a, a reach, but um, if if one holds, you know, with the, the Midrash that uh, uh, only uh, one-fifth of the Israelites left Egypt and the rest uh, didn't want to leave and they stayed and they, they were killed, you know, could this conceivably be viewed as a reference to that, that four-fifths? I, I don't know if it is that that direct, but I for sure think it's part of the same theme, right? I, I, without a doubt, it doesn't need to be a reference of that. Clearly, this is highlighting that's not just non, non-Jewish nations that get punished to glorify God, but we get punished and that glorifies God. And that's for sure what's going on here. So whether it's a direct reference or not, it is a reference. Um, we continue on. We got Ela behind Shagu. Everything in society is modeled with wine and intoxication. Kohen the Navi, the Kohen, the priest that's supposed to teach, and the prophet, Shaguba Shekhar, they are muddled by, by alcohol, by liquor, by intoxication. Nivlaum and Ayayan, they are, and they have imbibed, they have been imbibed from wine. Ta'um Shekhar, they are. Uh, the muddle, the, they can't see properly um, from the from the intoxication. Shagubara, they can't have any vision. Their their vision is dazed. Haku their judgment plili is like a judgment. You don't want uh, uh, you know if someone says they have a mishpat plili, that's a criminal case against you. Haku their judgment is totally subverted and and stumbled. All their tables are filled with vomit and filth without any space left for anything else. No values around, right? The shulchan, the, 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 the centerpiece of a home is filled with filth and, and vomit of overabundance and of, uh, of, of contamination. There's nothing, there's no room for values. And me, you're me, i who will give them instruction? Who will give them the message? These newly weaned from milk, 
taken, recently taken away from the breasts, meaning there's a new generation coming. They're going to sprout out from the ground. How are they going to learn this? Kitsav letsav, sav letsav, kav letsav, kav letsav, zero sham, zero sham. A little bit, a little bit. There's an educational philosophy going on here. A little bit, just like you teach a two-year-old. You teach them a little bit, then they have playtime. You teach them a little bit more, and then they have recess, right? There needs to be a slow process here. People are gay, safav, lo shon acheret, yidaber alamazah. Has, it's a totally different uh, jargon that needs to be spoken to this nation. They want to listen. The word of God will be like this, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, this and this, this and this. All right, and that's the end of our Torah part of it. Right, continues on and it goes a little bit more. Lachain Shimud Var Hashem. This is not our Avtor yet. Anche uh, Anche uh, Tzion, um, but it's really a pun. It's supposed to be Anche uh, uh, Anche Latzon. Those that make a mockery. Mishalei Aham Ze Asher Yerushalayim. All those who govern in Jerusalem. Right, it's not just the north; it's the south also. The Avtor now skips to the third unit. And by the way, this whole unit, just uh, this is the end of a unit. What's the whole point of this unit? So it sort of takes on the hedonistic role and sin that that plays not just in the Northern Kingdom, but in the Egyptian Kingdom as well, which is a match to our Parsha. There are no leaders, no teachers, no one to teach the people, right? That seems to be the case in Egypt as well, right? Uh, because of the slavery, there's just no one to lead the people. Um, and they need to learn bit by bit. That the, the Jews need to be removed. They're engulfed by the culture and they need to be weaned off of it. And they need to be new. And this might be clearly a reference to uh, what Steve, what you alluded to, um, that, uh, that, that they're not all the Jews to escape Egypt. Many, 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 the vast majority of Jews don't escape Egypt. They're not able to be removed, not able to be uh, learned bit by bit. They're not able to uh, be weaned from the milk of this, uh, of this culture. Then we have the last part, chapter 23, chapter 29, on the last verses, um, uh, 22 and 23. Therefore, and you'll tell me what you think the role of this, these two verses are. Koamar Hashem, so says the Lord, obey Yaakov to the people of Jacob, to the house of Jacob, Asher Patad Abraham, who will redeem uh, Abraham. Don't be ashamed, Jacob. And don't uh, make your face pale or hide. You're, you'll be okay. Um, for you will see your children. My handy, my handiwork. Um, uh, in their midst will, and her will uh, um, uh, sanctify my name. And they will sanctify the name of the holy of Yaakov, the God of Yaakov, the Elohei Yisrael Yaritsu, and they will stand in awe in the presence of the God of Israel. Right? How does that Torah add nicely? A pretty nice way to end that Torah that's been, oh, you fat pigs who are whatever, right? Don't worry, Jacob, you'll be, re you'll be redeemed. You, you won't be shamed. God will sanctify, you'll see your children, and they will be the sanctification of God's name. And they will sanctify their God, the God of Israel, um, and they'll stand in awe of God, right? What do you think these two, these two verses are doing in our Torah? Well, very, very redemptive. I think it could be used in the context of foretelling the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash. I think this could have been used with the uh, formation of the state of Israel, I think that, uh, or for the, you know, the coming of the Mashiach. Uh, um, I think so, definitely. But I would argue, perhaps, that this is also a comment about what's our rule. Haftarot needs to have profit. It has to be positive. It has to end on an upbeat note. But this is the upbeat note that we're adding, right? We're talking about all these different things, but don't worry, right? Jacob will be redeemed. Abraham will be redeemed. I mean, it is. It fits nicely, right? This Elohei Yaakov, Elohei um, Elohei Kadosh Yaakov, Elohei Yisrael. 
fits nicely with the beginning of Ayim Yashri Shakov, Yat Sisu Farach Yisrael, referring to the Jewish people in both of those ways. So we end like that. Um, and we're sort of tying together these, this vision of, 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 of opportunity um, that will happen, right? It's about sanctification of God's name and being a vehicle for that, right? So it could be, I would argue, that these, have to, these two verses are appended to be, you know, the end, right? We keep talking about time. We talked about one time where it's the exception to the rule. Well, that means you need to have the rule, right? So this is the rule. The rule is after it needs to be positive. After it needs to end the words of redemption or words of consolation. What better words than these that we're reading right now? Well, it kind of wraps it because the first few verses are saying, you know, right, exactly. we'll bud and we'll blossom. And then he's like, then he's castigates the heck out of everybody. And then he kind of wraps it back up saying, but, you know, hang on there. It, it, all good is coming. Exactly. And I think that, and it's specifically echoing the way he talks, Yaakov and Yisrael. So I think, I think that's probably what's going on here. Um, and that's the third unit. So we've, we've seen the three units of the Saptora. Um, we noted how there are some similar comparisons to Egypt, to the experience in Egypt, to the idea of uh, you know, needing to break free of the Egyptian culture that's engulfing them and move forward, that the punishment of the Egyptians and the punishment of the Ephraimites are this also the sanctification, glorification of God for when punishment comes to people when punishment comes to people, they that deserve it, that that glorifies God, um, and that's sort of the case here. So we'll stop here, and uh, we'll see everyone next week. You have a question? Yeah, yeah, you got on mute. Yeah, you want to stop the recording? Sure.